Hi, everyone. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy news journalist for over 20 years. This is our news segment that we call Space Bites. Now, I write a weekly email newsletter that goes out to over 50,000 people every week, but they're really big, a lot of reading to be done. And we know that some people would prefer to have the news videoed at them as opposed to having to sit down and read. So these are our bite sized new segments of some of the top space and astronomy news segments happening this week. All right, let's get into the news. They did it. They actually did it. Rocket Lab caught a booster and then dropped it again. Step aside, SpaceX. There's another reusable launch platform on the market. Rocket Lab. Sort of. This week, Rocket Lab on May 2nd launched an electron rocket carrying 34 satellites into low Earth orbit. No problem. But they promised that this time around they were going to try to catch the booster stage with a helicopter. And they did. We've got a, you know, somewhat disappointing video of the helicopter zooming in on the parachute, carrying the booster rocket as it was gently floating down to Earth. And they actually caught it with a Sikorsky 92 helicopter. And then apparently, because the booster was swinging back and forth, they didn't like how it was being held under the helicopter, they decided to release it again, and it dropped harmlessly into the ocean. Now, a lot of people complained that the video wasn't great. You just got this sort of fairly grainy footage of them catching the, the booster. So like, I've heard recommendations like why wasn't there another helicopter chasing the first helicopter to film that and maybe there should have been a drone filming the helicopter filming the other helicopter. So we've gotten really good footage. Anyway, it was a good shot. Uh, I'm sure next time around, they'll actually catch the booster, carry it back to the launch facility, refurbish it, and we could see a second launch from an electron rocket booster, which would be pretty cool. China is going to be building an asteroid deflection mission of their own. I'm sure you're aware NASA has launched their DART mission, the double asteroid redirection test to fly out and impact the moon of asteroid Didymus. And hopefully the asteroid is going to be pushed a little off of its orbit in an amount that NASA will be able to detect and they'll be able to figure out how hard is it to shift an asteroid in orbit? And of course, potentially, if there's a dangerous asteroid that's coming towards Earth, they'll be able to know what it's going to take to push that asteroid off of a deadly trajectory. And we just got news this week that China is working on their own version of this mission as well. Now, we don't have any details yet. We know they're going to be launching this mission in 2025, and it's going to be part of a larger detection defense system that China is planning. But as part of this, they're going to choose a target and they're going to send an impactor into that target, see if they can push it off course and add to this understanding. And so we'll have sort of two pieces of information, what NASA has learned from DART and what China will have learned from their redirect mission. And that will give more data points to get a sense of what it's going to take to be able to relocate a dangerous asteroid that could be smashing into Earth in the future. Astronomers discover a new kind of nova, a micronova. Ah, now I'm sure you're aware of what a supernova is, where a star explodes, turns into a black hole, releases as much energy as an entire galaxy, blasting out material at relativistic speeds, destroying the star in the process, creating a black hole. It's a catastrophic event. A nova is where you've got a white dwarf that is actively feeding from some companion star and material is layering out onto the surface of the white dwarf. And when enough of it builds up, it acts like a thermonuclear explosion and releases a flare of energy. And then the material builds up again and releases more energy. And eventually over a long enough period of time, enough material has accreted onto the white dwarf that it detonates as a type 1a supernova. Of course, if you want to get pedantic, right, there are different kinds of supernova. You can have a core collapse supernova that can produce either a neutron star or a black hole, or you can have a type 1 a supernova where the star completely detonates entirely and it came from a white dwarf and you can have a supernova where the star is so massive that it completely detonates leaving nothing behind so there are many different kinds of supernova and so now astronomers have found this new kind called a micronova 
And what's happening here is it's the same thing. You've got a white dwarf and it's feeding from a companion star, but the white dwarf has fairly powerful magnetic field lines that are emanating out of its poles. And so as material is streaming in from this companion star, it's following these magnetic field lines and piling getting deposited piling up in blobs onto the poles of the white dwarf. And same as with the with a Nova, once enough material piles up in this small area, it ignites as like a thermonuclear bomb releases a flash of energy. And then the process happens again. And it's it's still really powerful. It's still giving off an incomprehensible amount of energy, but it's not as much as a Nova. And it's definitely not as much as a supernova. So it's a micronova, but still very powerful. What comes after seeing a black holes event horizon? We see the photon ring. Last week, we were teased by the European Southern Observatory that we were going to be seeing some big announcement from the Event Horizon Telescope. What could it be? A image from the Event Horizon Telescope of something that's in the Milky Way? Aliens, I'm guessing. But what comes next? Like, if you want to be able to image the region around a black hole, and we've already seen this image of the event horizon around M87, what is the next thing on the list of astronomers? And that is to see the photon ring. And so when you get closer and closer into the black hole, you reach this region called the photon ring. And this is where light itself photons are under such pull of the gravity of the black hole that they're orbiting around the black hole like like little planets. And this area theoretically should be visible. How can we see it? Well, the Event Horizon Telescope, which is merely a telescope the size of planet Earth, is not powerful enough to see the photon ring around a black hole. In order to do that, you have to go to space. And so it was a really interesting study that we found this week where they calculated what kinds of additional space telescopes would have to be added to the event horizon telescope to provide the kind of resolution that would allow you to see a black holes photon ring. I don't know what comes after the photon ring. At a certain point, it's going to be uh, there's nothing else to see. Astronomers have discovered light echoes from black holes. So when a black hole is actively feeding, say a blob of gas falls into it or a planet or a starship or a star or whatever, uh, it adds to the mass of the black hole, but it also releases a flash of gamma radiation because black holes are messy eaters. These scenarios come up when you've got a black hole with some companion star orbiting around each other and the companion star is feeding material into the black hole generating this accretion disk. And so you've got this accretion disk around the black hole, say it's feeding from some companion star. And this accretion disk is whirling around and piling up around the black hole waiting for its turn to go into the black hole. And as this material is falling in, as big blobs go in, you get these blasts of gamma radiation. And this gamma radiation flies outward through the accretion disk, radiating, releasing flashes of light, and it's going the speed of light. And so we can detect these flashes of light as this radiation is going through the accretion disk. And astronomers call this a black hole echo. And to date, astronomers had only seen two of these black holes with echoes. And now a new survey has turned up eight more of them. And so now you've got a total of 10 of these black hole echo situations that astronomers can use to study to understand how black holes feed. And it's quite amazing because even though these are very far away, and even if relatively small amounts of mass get added to the black hole, it's such a powerful blast of radiation that it can be detected. And you can not only detect the initial blast of radiation, but you can also see this radiation as it is propagating through the accretion disk surrounding the black hole. We just got the news that NASA is probably going to be pushing back the launch of Artemis one until August. And that's good news for them because we're trying to reach 1000 Patreon subscribers before Artemis one launches or the SpaceX Starship launches. We're in the 900s right now. Can you help us reach 1000 patrons before SpaceX Starship flies or SLS Artemis one flies? I think you can go to patreon.com slash universe today. Now, this money is not for me. 
This is to support the salaries of all of the people involved. Anton, Chad, Nancy, all of the writers with Universe Today. We've got a big team and all of your support helps us pay salary, be able to bring on new writers for Universe Today, create even more content, podcasts, videos, etc. So we really appreciate your support. Go to patreon.com slash universe today. So we've added a bunch of new content on our Patreon page and not just for patrons only, but also just for anyone who wants to listen. And most recently, we've got an interview with Anton behind the scenes. You can hear his his story, how he got involved with the universe today, what he's working on to help create better content, including this news show. So thanks, Anton. So come patreon.com slash universe today. Check that out and some of the other content that we're putting up there. NASA has announced prizes for its second I Shrunk the Payload Challenge. For the last couple of years, NASA has been working with HeroX to release a bunch of challenges to the public where anyone can come up with ideas to solve problems for NASA and earn prizes to be able to do this. They've done two of the Honey I Shrunk the Payload challenges, and we just got an announcement of the winners of the second challenge just this week. And so the goal of this Honey, I Shrunk the Payload is to take what are fairly traditional, large science instruments and figure out really clever ways to be able to shrink their size, power requirements to fit within fairly small lunar landers. And we got the three winners this week. The first place is the Sun Slicer Spectrometer, a miniature low power X-ray spectrometer. The second place is the Pulley Lunar Water Snooper, which is a low cost, simple, extremely lightweight neutron spectrometer that detects hydrogen atoms in lunar regolith. And for third place is URAD, a miniature radiation detector that will help characterize the dangers of radiation exposure and absorption in the lunar environment. And NASA is also looking for help with Mars. And this is a challenge that you can apply to. And we already have these kinds of simulations here on Earth. They're called Mars analogs, where volunteers will go in a simulated Mars habitat. They have to put on spacesuits every time they want to go outside. They have to have communications delays to talk to ground control. But how can we simulate the experience of being on Mars better? How can we use virtual reality, augmented reality, actual physical structures to be able to simulate the day length on Mars or the lower gravity on Mars or the color of the sky or the kinds of landscapes that Martian explorers are going to experience. So if you've got some ideas, you can join the Mars XR challenge. And quick disclaimer, I used to work with Hero X. I was the product manager for the Hero X platform. So I'm friends with the people behind the projects, but still they're pretty cool and you should check them out. Finally, this is a really cool video. These are astronauts on board the International Space Station who are having fun while the station is getting boosted. Now, the International Space Station flies fairly low for its orbit, and it's still getting a lot of drag from the Earth's atmosphere. And every few months, they have to raise the altitude of the space station. And when this happens, of course, the station is getting a slight acceleration, but the astronauts on board are still going the old speed. And so from their perspective, they fall inside the space station. So this video that you're watching was actually sped up eight times and you can see them taking turns falling backwards through the space station. And it isn't until they get a chance to hold on to the wall and get accelerated to the same rate as the rest of the station that they stop experiencing this difference. But it looks like a lot of fun. It's important to note that this boost was made with a Russian progress spacecraft that was attached to the station. And of course, this is a little tricky because of the Russia Ukrainian war we probably won't see any more progress spaceships for a little while. Now the Cygnus cargo vessel is able to do this maneuver as well. But the Cygnus is using Russian engines as well. anyway, it's complicated. And there's going to need to be some new ways to boost the altitude of the space station while this situation gets worked out. So stay tuned. But still, it's fun. It's been a great week for interviews on Universe Today. And so you haven't checked them out, you definitely should. Uh, I talked to Scott Peterson about how to search for micrometeorites. These are like 0.2 to 0.4 millimeter meteorites that are falling on your roof. And you can go with a magnet, collect them up, look at them under a microscope, and actually find little chunks of metal and rock that came from space. The other interview I did 
is with Dr. Sam Howell, who comes from NASA, and he's working on both the Europa Clipper, but also figuring out ways to get under the ice on Europa. How do we drill down through kilometers of ice to reach the ocean underneath and find those European space whales? And it was such an amazing interview. We went far longer than we normally do. Sam was a wealth of information, and we really covered every single question that I get here on the channel all the time. So you should definitely check out that interview if you haven't already seen it. All right. Well, those were all of the news segments we want to cover this week. Now, this is just a fraction of the news that's in the weekly email newsletter and on Universe Today, like seven stories. I think we have like 30 or 40 that came out this week. So there's a lot of news on Universe Today. I, this newsletter is a monster this week. But if you want to check them all out, make sure you're subscribed to my weekly email newsletter. Go to university.com slash newsletter and sign up. You can also get an audio version of all of the videos that we do on this channel, as well as interviews with me, other bonus stuff on our podcast feed. Just go to university.com slash podcast to sign up or just search for University Today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and consider joining our Patreon. We have the minimum amount of ads on our videos, no ads in our podcast, no ads in the newsletter. And if you join as a patron, you'll get no ads on Universe Today for life. That is how valuable your support is to us. And thanks to all of the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, the galaxy wanderers, and everyone who's subscribed at the other tiers, your support means the universe to us at Universe Today. All right, hope you enjoyed the news and we'll see you next week.